this is our sixth African Studies lecture series of this academic year, and it's the last one of this winter quarter. Um, we're very happy to have um, Dr. Stephen Dupin making a presentation today. And I want to thank um, a few of our sponsors of the African Studies lecture series, including the Oregon Humanities Center, the Clark Honors College, um, Global Organ, the Department of Anthropology, and the Program in African Studies here have all generously given funding for our coffee and tea and cookies. Um, so a little bit about Dr. Dupin. He received his bachelor's in anthropology at the University of California, San Diego, and his master's and PhD are both from the University of Michigan. He's currently here at the University of Oregon in the Department of Anthropology as an American Council of Learned Societies um, new faculty fellow. He's worked on archaeological projects in Burkina Faso, Senegal, Kenya, and since 2004, he's been working in Burkina Faso. He has a book coming out in May with Equinox Press that's titled Revolution in the Savannah, The Origins of a West African Political System. And we are very happy to have him here, and it looks like permanently, hopefully, here in Eugene at the university. So thank you very much, and we look forward to your talk. So I appreciate the invitation to speak in the series. Uh, the African Studies Lecture Series is a, an exciting and I think important thing for this campus as African Studies is only in its infancy here and it's hopefully over the next couple of years going to grow significantly. So my talk today is about political systems in Africa. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the different ways that leaders legitimize power in different societies and how we model this archaeologically. Now, of course, the archaeological past in West Africa, of course, doesn't have writing systems. So we don't have this historical record that a lot of people yield to uh, in studies of the past. So you have to figure out kind of more uh, innovative approaches to understand how different human activities are materialized and then how to interpret that from the archaeological record as you're digging through different sites. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of modeling first, and then I'm going to get into the archaeology and how we actually understand political events in the past. And I'm going to talk about two different types of political action, um, those that create exclusionary power, or that's where one segment of society gains power over the rest of society, and more corporate types of power that are more egalitarian in structure. And both of these pl things play roles in all political trajectories. Um, an example of a corporate kind of political event would be the American Revolution, of course, right? And then things that are more exclusionary in power is like the creation of kingdoms with despotic power, like in ancient Egypt. So I'll talk a little bit about how these things occurred both in the present in Burkina Faso and also in the past. So there's a couple of different theoretical issues um, when you're trying to understand ancient politics that one needs to kind of keep in mind. And I'll talk about how we model these different things. One, of course, is sources and types of power. Now, in terms of political manipulation for different types of political action, all sorts of things can be used uh, because different types of spiritual power can reside in all sorts of aspects of society, whether it be ironworking. The divinities of the deep earth is something I'll talk about, and the potency of the divinities of the deep earth in many Voltaic societies. Um, other things, you know, other types of fetishes, like the Quara fetish, we'll talk about in a little bit, is a protective deity. It's symbolized in the fetish of a cow's horns in a Quara shrine uh, in Guernsey society, and that is imbued with potency and is used in a political project toward centralization of power. So basically, political power can come from anywhere. Symbols are manipulated by elites for their own advantage. But symbols can also be manipulated by a community for more egalitarian political missions. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. A lot of political analyses tend to focus on centralization of power and despotism, but tend to forget about egalitarianism as a kind of active political construct. So that's one of the first topics here. Now, almost all the power in, in kind of historic and also in prehistoric Burkina Faso relates to kind of issues of divine power and intercession. And this is where individuals maintain relationships with particular di divinities. So a household head maintains relationships with the ancestors. And therein, he derives part of his political power. Right? The rest of the family will subsume um, kind of the political advantage to him as he's being an intercessor with the ancestors to get their goodwill. Right? And this is, is manipulated within the political process. And a lot of this has to do with... Um, the way it's materialized, of course, is in sacrifices. And those are kind of the material representations of prayers. There's a lot of animal sacrifice. And one of the things I do is I also do archaeozoology, so I study animal remains and interpret which animals were killed and in what contexts. And 
in my excavations, I found even areas where people were sacrificing chickens to the ancestors and ancestor shrines. And so these things materialized in the archaeological record. Um, a lot of the things that are being sacrificed too, and kind of at the root of political process, is ancestors and other divinities. Now, ancestors, of course, are huge. Um, and I'm going to talk about social anchoring and founding of a village. When an ancestor makes a pact with the divinities of nature in founding a village, that is a hugely potent political act. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Divinities, of course, can be wide-ranging. We're talking about gods, some of them anthropomorphic, some of them not. We're talking about divinities of nature and different types of divinities. And in studying societies, um, you know, one, one of the reasons why an anthropological approach to archaeology is hugely important in understanding African societies is you have to understand how divinities work and what is their potential potency in different social systems. So you have to understand categorizations of divinities. Um, for example, you know, many of these societies have a division between the divinities on the surface of the earth, which are one category of wild divinities, and those that are under the earth. Those that are under the earth are more potent in terms of political power and tend to be manipulated towards exclusionary power missions. Does that make sense to everyone? Another aspect that tends to be kind of underplayed is symbolic and objective dimensions of power um, in political analyses. Now, we tend to focus, because of kind of focus on Marxist approaches to anthropology and also to political power, on objective dimensions. And those are kind of uh, things like commodities and you know, how they can play a role in the political process. Oftentimes, like things that are necessary, like salt or food, uh, commodities of that nature. But there's lots of different types of things and sources of power that can be manipulated for various political missions. And some of those are purely symbolic, like the Quara fetish. Uh, that I'm going to talk about from Guernsey Society. And that is less tied to a commodity. And so, you know, different types of things can be manipulated for political ends. It doesn't have to be immediately connected to issues of commodification. Okay, so there's all sorts of active political missions that are um, disassociated from those kinds of ob um, objective dimensions. Another thing which one needs to take into account in understanding political change in Burkina Faso is the influence of gerontocracy on political action and also land rights. I'll get into land rights in a moment. But in many of these political systems, it's the oldest man of the oldest generation who controls the political process, regardless of their particular talent. Right? So if a hierarchy is held by a particular social segment, like a house or a lineage, the oldest man of the oldest generation is the one who will control the intercession, the sacrifices for political action. Right? And that's inalienable. And that's regardless of whether they are a particularly gifted politician or not, because that hierarchy is ascribed to that particular social segment. Does that make sense to everyone? Another aspect which needs to be taken into account also confused Marxist analyses in Africa. In Burkina Faso, this is particularly the case in Voltaic societies, is general egalitarian concepts of land. It is considered totally inappropriate in Burkina Faso, uh, traditionally, to not allow someone to have access to farming land. It is a universal right, and it's not manipulated in the political process. This um, caused a lot of debate within anthropology in the 50s and 60s, particularly because there was a huge strain of Marxist anthropologists who wanted to see land tenure as kind of the root of despotism and the creation of class structures. However, when you actually look at power dynamics in, in Bur Burkinabe states and other types of political systems, control over land is not something that is manipulated by elites, even when they gained incredible power. For example, the Mossi kings didn't control more land than the people who were under them. It was considered inappropriate to not allow people to have farming land. So that not being part of the manipulation process in politics is a hugely important thing to keep in mind. Right? So, the very nature of how we think about states and how we think about political systems in different parts of the world need to be revised to understand Burkinabe politics. Okay, so those are kind of. I like this. This is a particularly interesting thing to me: that concept of open access to land for political manipulation. So where are we talking about? I'm going to talk about a bunch of 20th century societies, and I'm going to talk about the archaeological record in Burkina Faso. You may be familiar. Um, if you've ever taken uh, African history classes or archaeology classes on West Africa, um, you may have heard of the Malian states, you know, the ancient empire of Mali, Mansa Musa there. And then these are the Masi states, 
and that's the Moronaba leading his knights to battle, and that's a Voltaic state. And the area that I'm working in, and the societies I'm going to talk about today, are non-state societies that live between these two areas. Um, but they have incredibly complex political systems. Uh, they were kind of seen in the colonial era, the colonial governments often saw them as extremely primitive societies in their, in their frameworks. However, the reality is that they never took the time to actually understand who was living there and what kinds of political systems they lived in. And actually what we see in looking at the, at the political record and the archaeological record is that they're incredibly complex. And that's because they're rooted in a lot of egalitarian principles. Okay. Another interesting thing about this region is something that also calls into question many models for political complexity is that um, the Mossi states didn't actually have cities. You know, the capital of the Mossi Empire was basically a large village, Ouagadougou, um, where the Moranaba lived. You're talking about 3,000 people at the time the French took over. But it was a different type of landscape. The social landscape was a landscape of power where the Moranaba, the emperor, the Mossi controlled all the villages in the region. And you're talking millions of people, but they were dispersed throughout the landscape in little villages rather than in clustered cities. And this calls into question many of our aspects of what is a city and what is complexity and how do the economics of cities work. So as you can see, this area is um, fruitful, potentially very fruitful for political analyses and understandings of all sorts of things from economics to uh, political action. And so the area I'm working in here is Western Burkina Faso. And these are some of the societies I'll be talking about today. I've been studying the origins of the Bois. And the site I'm working on in Cherry Congo is right there where that red dot is. But I'm going to be talking about political action in Gurinzi society. Because ultimately speaking, as you go into the past, you know, a long time ago, the societies deep in the past are actually the ancestors of many of these different societies. And you're talking about diversification of societies over time. So if we go back 2,000 years, it's probably the ancestors of all these people who live in this region today. It's their shared ancestors before societies diverge over time. So we're going to look at some power dynamics in Gurinzi society. We'll talk about the Mossi peripherally, um, some events in Bobo society, and then a society that's related to the Lobi, the Guan, right here. And I'm going to talk about power dynamics in these different areas. So what do people do there today? So um, <laughs> Western Burkina Faso is an area full of different village societies, um, and they have extremely complex political structures from place to place, but all of them are farmers. And so these are some pictures from the area I work in. Um, they keep livestock. People brew millet beer, and that actually millet beer is a very important part of the caloric intake year-round. They have domestic animals like guinea fowl. You know, they keep chickens and guinea fowl, but here's the, an African domesticate. Guinea fowl are native to Africa, and we don't really know much about their domestication histories. So that's something that uh, I've been trying to investigate in my archaeozoology. People consume millet, sorghum and fonio, African grains that were domesticated in Africa. And here is a woman grinding the grain to make tow, which I don't know if anyone here has ever eaten tow, but it's kind of a thick porridge made of these things. But people also consume all sorts of wild resources uh, in the landscape. This is a locust bean, and they make sumbala, which is a kind of a soup-based, a stew-based uh, flavoring that's very common and very popular throughout Burkina Faso. People use fish from the river. That's a Clarius heterobronchus catfish, um, commonly consumed in the area. In the past, people hunted quite a bit. And I'll be talking about the social characteristics of hunting and what hunting means and how you can look at social action from hunting. They also did a lot of garden hunting. These are farmers, and so you have to kill the animals that would take out your crop. And so a lot of the animals, like the cane rat, this is a large, you know, 10 to 12 pound rat that eats your millet. And so what you get in the archaeological sites is people hunting in the fields because they don't want them eating their millet. And then here's shea butter. This area is one of the um, most high yielding regions in West Africa for the production of shea butter. And so shea butter is also a way where women uh, can have a little bit of an income to use in buying domestic things like pottery or um, seasoning salt, things of that nature. So that's kind of what people do. Now I'm going to descend into a couple different political articulations so you can see the diversity. Uh, and the French uh, colonial government didn't recognize much of this diversity because they never took the time to understand it. But as you're going to see, people living in seemingly similar villages have totally different political structures. So we're going to start with the Gurenzi. Um, 
just as a kind of a basic framework for analysis, the Guernsey live in houses. And all the societies that I'm going to be talking about today live in houses. These are ba large, basic social units. They don't live in elementary families, right? You're talking about social groups that are 20, 60 people. In the ethnographic record, some of them were 200 to 300 people as your basic social unit. This is the production unit who shares all their resources from farming. So if you don't know the basic social units, you can't actually interpret the archaeological record in the region. You're not dealing with elementary fam families or ownership by elementary families. And I'll be talking a little bit about property ownership as well within these systems. So the house in Grinsey society is functionally an agnatic group, so it's basically a patrilineal segment. It's a male, a father and his male sons who live in the house together with all of their wives. And this is a polygamous society, so that can be quite a few elementary families with it living within the house. So the household head is a very spiritually potent character because he controls the ancestors of the house. And lineal descent is inc incredibly important. So there's all sorts of ancestor shrines, and that plays a role in politics. It also allows the household head to control the economy of the house. It sanctions their right and control over the economic resources of the house. At the village level, there's a whole bunch of different hierarchies that are also controlled by leaders who petition the divinities or the ancestors, as it would be. One of which is the earth priest. Um, and the earth priest is functionally the person who founded the village or the descendant of the people who founded the village, right? And through his lineal descent to that village founder, he kind of legitimizes his power. And so this maintains the fundamental relationships with nature. So in creating the village and settling the village, the, this founder made a pact with the divinities of the local area. And in this, this basic pact, which was based in ritual sacrifice of the blood of a particular animal, it sanctioned the village and it would cause for well-being for the village community within this general landscape of divinities. And so that's an important political role. There's also a village chief who's kind of distinct from the earth priest. And they control the protective force of the village, which is the Kuara. But this is interesting because this is not something that may be indigenous to the Guernsey political system. This is how the Mossi and Mossi elites took over parts of Guernsey land. So many of the families throughout Guernsey land that control the Kuara are actually of Mossi origin, which is from that state level society that had the, you know, the emperor. And they moved into Guernsey land and they started taking over the local political systems. But they used something called the Quara in order to legitimize their divine power over the community as part of an exclusionary power mission, right? So previously there may have been only an earth priest who may have played a larger political role, but he's been kind of pushed aside in many cases by the Quara. And so what is the Quara? So the earth shrine, of course, maintains access to the divinities you know, of the earth and kind of well-being in the farming situation. Well, the Quara is rooted in kind of protection of the village. And in the last couple hundred years, there's been a lot of violence in Guernsey land um, from various different political events, from Islamic states moving in from the north, but also the Mossi elites uh, to the east. And this is functionally a protective force that allows society to live and be protected and have well-being despite the fact that there's fear out there. And so this is a manipulation of people's fear. The Quara fetish is symbolized or materialized in, a, in the horns of a cow. And so this is kind of an interesting thing. But it's enshrouded in mystery. No one locally speaking knows what the Quara is. You know, it's a mysterious divinity that protects the village community. And if you mess with the leaders who control that access to that divinity, then bad things will happen. And that is the manipulation for political power. With the Quara, with this one family controlling the Quara, they started to, uh, they have to extract all sorts of resources from the community to make those sacrifices. So they extract livestock and all sorts of other things and tax the community. And all those things are used as libations in the political process to legitimize their very power. And in some places in, in Guernsey land, this has led towards the creation of stratification, such as there are people who are in the local languages are called dominators and dominated. And it's all rooted in the political apparatus of the Quara, which no one except for those elites can go into the hut that controls the shrine where they do the sacrifices. It's mysterious and it's off limits. 
There's another um, kind of node of power within Guernsey society, which probably pre-exists the Quora as well, and that's the chief of the mass. And this is the person who manages the ancestor cult for the village community. And so that's a separate um, kind of node of power, and they're a moral authority. But where the Quara has taken over and become more extensive in power, it's kind of marginalized the role of this particular political leader. So this is kind of an interesting uh, historical case study. But it tells you a lot about how exclusionary power missions, how people gain control over society. And it's by using mysterious sources of power. And I'll return to that when I look at some of the other societies in this list. So just here's a, I talked about the house being the basic social unit. This is a Grinzy house. Each one of these things is an elementary family. This is the basic social unit. You're not dealing with elementary families, right? You're dealing with people who are sharing their agricultural resources and farming together. And the ancestor, you know, often has an ancestral shrine somewhere right here, and here's where the headman would live. The oldest man of the oldest generation lives in this hut right here opposite the door. And so functionally speaking, he controls the hierarchy within the house and controls access to the divinities and the ancestors uh, of the particular house and does all the sacrifices. Now I'm going to go over another society called the Guan, and you're going to start to see some patterns in political um, kind of articulations. So the Guan, they have agnatic group residence as well, so it's a patrilineal segment as well. So it's a man and his sons living together within a house. But the village level political organization is totally different. And what is regional is also totally different. You know, even these seemingly, you can drive through Western Burkina, lots of diplomats tell me this, you know, when they come back from Western Burkina, I don't see any difference in any of these villages anywhere. But as you can see, there's incredible differences in kinship structures, property ownership. So in a Guan village, there is no separate village priest and earth priest. They're one and the same. One person controls both of those nodes of power. Um, so it's a single individual in two categorically different roles. As earth priests, they communicate with the fundamental natural divinities. And this is rooted in the founding of the village. Right? When they set the village down, they establish this pact. And it's interesting in this case, um, when you actually delve into the ethnography of the Guan, it's, um, so you have the descendant, who is the headman in the village, who controls the earth shrine. But he actually has to ask his ancestor to do the sacrifices for the house to the divinities of nature. He can't actually access the divinities of nature himself. So when he prays, he prays to his ancestor to make the proper sacrifice to the divinities. So it's even one step removed from direct intercession. It's kind of an interesting uh, political thing. Then he's also the village chief. And in this case, the village chief, his control and his um, kind of how he sanctions the community is by sacrifices to divinities of rainfall and warfare. But one of the most interesting things as a representation of the village, he also sacrifices against himself, abusing his power. So there's all sorts of spiritual and sanctions and checks on his exclusionary power. So it's inappropriate, of course, for him to try to enact his own political missions or gain even more power over the community or extract taxes. And that's actually encoded in the ritual structure. Every day, the village chief does a bunch of prayers to the divinities to not allow him to become more powerful. And that's kind of an interesting uh, political process. But part of this kind of the lack of power at the village level in terms of centralization is in control over economic resources and how those uh, occur in Guan society. And that is the intersection between the house, which is the production group, everyone producing together, farming together, and consuming together, and the region. Something about Guan society is that Guan society is matrilineal. Guernsey society is patrilineal and patrilocal. But Guan society is not. Guan society is actually matrilineal, but people live with their patriline. Right, so this is incredibly complicated in kind of its structure. But the matriline is the one who controls the wealth. So wealth is not held in the household. And at the death of a household head, all of the wealth, the cattle and all the economic things that would be co-opted within the house, actually go to the mother's brother. Right, so it all goes to the matriline. So it actually leaves the house. And so every generation, the economic portfolio is reset. And therein, no one can co-opt power intergenerationally, right? Does that make sense? So that's a hugely important mechanism for egalitarian social relationships. 
if you can't pass on wealth to your children and it leaves the house, you can see how politically speaking, this is a wonderful mechanism for maintaining egalitarian social relationships. It also erodes the potential power or exclusionary power at the village level because oftentimes that wealth will leave the village, right? Does that make sense to everyone? So the Guan structure is actually quite fascinating uh, in its very nature here. And it's very different from the Grinzi organization. So Guan villages, because there's also this regional component, tend to have quartiers or little quarters that are spread out throughout the landscape. They're less clustered in organization and they're less kind of, because the, the nature of the earth priest and village chief, he has much less exclusionary power. Even the villages are more dispersed in organization. Even the houses, there's a lot less hierarchy within the houses. So while the houses can tend to be a lot of people, you know, so got an um, old man and all of his sons and all of their wives living together, you know, it tends to be much more diffuse in organization than the codified Guernsey house, which is more simplistic in its control. And at the death of the household head, all the economic resources will go to the matriline, and also all the sons of different mothers will disperse throughout the landscape. So the very house itself dissolves at the death of the household head and a new one begins. An economic reset button occurs. And here's the society that I work with which has a totally different political structure. And this is the Bois. Now the Bois also live in agnatic groups, you know, patrilineal segments as their house. But in this case it's not a closed house. It's a house that interacts with the community a great deal. And while they farm together, they do all sorts of other activities um, together. But of course, the head of household controls the ancestors of the house and there's an ancestor shrine within every house to those ancestors. But there's a whole bunch of different things that occur at the village level in Bois society, um, which is part of a historical trajectory which I'm gonna tell you how that came to be from my archeology. span So in this case, Bois society is divided into three different groups that can't intermarry with one another. You may have heard about some of these kinds of systems in Mali, places like that. So there are farmers. Now farmers, the oldest, um, you know, the oldest lineage segment or oldest house of the farmer group within society is the one that controls the earth and ancestral shrines. And those, like in the other societies, are derived from the village founders. So it is the village founders, the descendants of the village founders who control that particular node of power, right? Divided into two parts, earth and ancestral shrines. These are divided into two categorical di distinctions, Nyamuni and Tu, um, within Bois society. But there's also iron workers. Iron workers have access to the divinities of the deep earth. There's a whole other set of divinities that they derive their power from. And they have authority in the judicial process, but they also control access to, you know, the, the tools for agricultural labor, right? And they can't intermarry with the farmers. There's another group that, in, that do not intermarry with the others, which are the griots. And they are musicians, but they also do um, some craft activities, like they make fabrics and they tan hides. But they facilitate all intercessions by other groups because in all the ritual sacrifices and all the different events that legitimize power in these other nodes, they are the soundtrack and they are a necessary part of every one of these. And if they weren't part of it, then the sacrifices would not be taken well by the divinities and consequently bad things would happen within the village community. So they control another node of power. And I'm gonna talk about where they come from. But something that the Bois have and it's actually shared in two different societies, two other societies that are from different linguistic groups, so it might be part of a similar history, is there's something called the Do. And I'm gonna talk about the origins of the Do religious system. And the Do religious system is an egalitarian religious system. It's not about one family controlling access to any particular divinities. This is actually something that everyone in the community participates in. It's a participatory egalitarian religious system. So everyone goes through initiation within the society of the Do, and, um, and in so doing, they become members of the Do, and then throughout their lifetime, they engage in communalistic activities that will cause for the Do divinities, the Bweni and his brother, to give goodwill to humanity and allow the village community to live on. So it's only through egalitarian social relationships and communal action that good things will happen to the community. Does that make sense? 
if someone tries to go it alone, if someone tries to co-op power, then that'll disrupt the equilibrium within the dough. Now, one of the interesting things here, and I, I do want to draw a distinction between, is that the dough and iron working are mysterious. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the histories of these two in particular. But the dough, of course, is revealed to everyone throughout their life, so it's an achievable mystery. Iron working is restricted to one family, and those are very powerful divinities. And you'll understand what I mean when you look at the history of Bois society and how they came to be. So here's a modern Bois village, Torah, uh, where I do a lot of my field work around. Um, this winter, last winter, I spent a lot of time in Torah. So these are different distinctions within societies. Ironsmiths, here's an ironsmith right here, are married to potters, right? And so that's one of the nodes of power. So they control the divinities of the deeper, right? And they only intermarry with other ironsmiths and potters. Then there's farmers, which are the vast majority of society. They control the earth and ancestral shrines. And then there are griots. And griots are hugely important for political action because they are the soundtrack to all ritual activity. Bois villages are very different in their organization. People don't live in closed compounds because they interact within the community extensively. And so people live in kind of these little room blocks. And all activities occur in the open. Storage occurs in the open. People don't keep their, economic, their belongings within the houses in many cases. They do a lot of things out in the courtyards and everyone can see what everyone's doing. It wasn't always like that. And here's a Bois room block. This is kind of how people live. They do a lot of activities on the exterior, as you can see. So some of the things politically we have to take into account here is that there's mysterious sources of power, and these sanction political missions, right? One of the universals in all these societies is that the village founder controls either you know, the basic pact with the divinities of nature or an ancestral right, whether it's divided into two categorical roles or not. Um, is a little bit more open to question. But those are ones that haven't been used historically for exclusionary or egalitarian political missions. Those are just R, right? Which is not to say that they aren't a stepping stone to other types of political action. But the types of political action that tend to sanction political missions are those that are more mysterious, where people don't understand where they're coming from, and those are much more manipulatable. And this is actually a, a pretty general, uh, generally understood thing in political action. If something is more mysterious and potentially potent, it can be much more manipulated for exclusionary power within any given society. So exclusionary power, or you know, control over society by a small group of individuals, um, these are, tend to be kind of when these mysterious sources of power are restricted and manipulated. And I'll talk a little bit about how that happens over time. And egalitarian power, although mysterious, can be in missions that are achievable by all. And that is the emergence of the Doe religious system. So I'm going to talk now about how we address these things archaeologically. So before my research, note there hadn't been any research really about the Bois or the origins of the Bois. Um, they were heavily primitivized in, in colonial documents. Um, and we didn't really know about their histories or how complex they were. And so I began a project to understand non-centralized um, non complexity where these egalitarian complex societies come from. And it was a hugely open question. And so I had to go in by modeling power dynamics within Voltaic societies to have basic understandings on how the political process works. So here's the site of Kiri Congo. This is a particularly well-preserved archeological site. And it yields a lot of um, kind of potentialities for interpreting social trajectories. It's located here in the Mahoon Bend. This is the Mahoon River. It's the only year-round flowing river in Burkina Faso. As you can see right here, there's a couple of different streams that enter into it. But there's an enormous number of Iron Age archaeological sites in this region. And so here's a map of the site. As you can see, you know, this is what the archaeological site is. It's 13 different mounds um, in a cluster. And so the intellectual question as an archaeologist is, what are these? in terms of social units, and how do they relate to one another, and how do you interpret the political trajectory of this village? So here's some examples. So these are mounds. Some of these mounds were, uh, are the residues of people living in the exact same spot for thousands of years. This village was founded around 100 AD, and it was abandoned around 1700 AD. Right? That is sustainability. A lot of people talk about sustainability. 
you can live in the exact same spot for 1,700 years if you have a well-designed system, and they did. So here's kind of the residues. There's a person standing right there. You can see these are very large mounds. And so we put excavation units into a bunch of these different mounds. We've done um, collections of the objects and artifacts that are on the surface. We've done shovel tests to look at plaza areas and see what activities are occurring in plaza areas. There's Daphne Gallagher working on some pottery right there. And we've also recorded, there's a road that goes right through the site, and so it's destroying some of the mounds, but we've recorded those road profiles. I've drawn all of those and taken all the artifacts off of them to look at what's going on over time. One of the things about Kerry Congo is it's incredibly well preserved. This is all ancient architecture. This stuff's from 1100 AD. Um, this stuff's from about 900 AD. This stuff's from 1600 AD. And this stuff's from 700 AD. And so we can actually walk into people's houses from these different periods from our excavations and see what they were doing. And there are materializations of all these political processes. And so this is the, some of the stuff you find in archaeological excavations. Here's an iron spear from 100 AD. Um, here's pottery. You know, you get complete bowls. There's grinding stones. You get botanical remains, um, carbonized, so we know what people were eating. Here's a cattle bone right there. Um, cowrie shells. So you can find all these things materialized in the archaeological record. And that is how we interpret uh, political events by reconstructing people's activities and how they materialize in place. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Kiri Congo. And then we're going to return to some of these theoretical topics that I've kind of introduced throughout the introduction. Everyone on board the train that we're moving along? Yeah. So Kiri Congo began. What you do in archaeological excavations is you try to build up the history, the occupation history of the site. Now, of course, there's 13 mounds in the group, but they all aren't from the same period, right? The site built up over time. And then it was abandoned kind of differentially. So I'll show you these different periods. So for the first 400 years, this is uh, yellow one. It's a period from about 100 to 500 AD. The village was founded by this household right here, um, which is Mound 4. And this was an economically generalized household. They did everything. They made their own pottery. We have evidence that they had an iron furnace next to them. They smithed their own iron. Um, they hunted in their fields because we get all those animals that people get when you do those kinds of activities. And they had cattle and sheep and goats and dogs and all those kinds of things. And so it was one social unit living in this area with its iron furnace for about 400 years. At the very end of Yellow One, an identical homestead gets founded right to its north, a couple hundred meters. And this one's identical in every single way. They have two different pottery production traditions. We can tell that by the pottery in each of the houses is made from learning traditions, kind of apprenticeship. So that basically patterns over time. People in this house made their pottery similarly over this entire trajectory. These people found theirs, and they started a new kind of pottery trajectory as well. So they're both making their own pottery. They both have their own iron furnace. They're both smithing their own iron. They both have cattle and other animals, and they're both farming in the field. So there's no differentiation. This is actually, for archaeological theory, this is a really important little moment in time. This is the origins of the village. Right? It's not a single homestead. It's turning into a village, but before differentiation occurs. In the process of differentiation in the subsequent periods, one can start to see some of the materializations of the political processes I've been talking about today. In the subsequent period, um, a whole bunch of new things occur within the village trajectory. Another homestead is founded up here. As you can see, these are pretty equidistant. This is not the settlement pattern that will occur later on in the site's history when people start centralizing power and people start moving in close to certain mounds. So this is kind of linear pattern. But a couple of things happen during Yellow 2 that kind of show the beginnings of political process within the community. A cemetery is founded right here. The only people who have access to the cemetery are the dead from Mound 4, the village founders. And there's a whole bunch of little shrines that occur within the cemetery. Ancestor shrines, they're false huts. So it's kind of a little city of the dead. But it's restricted to the dead of Mound 4. The dead from Mound 1 bury within their own houses and don't have access to the cemetery. Another thing that occurs is Mound 11 is not accompanied by an iron furnace. And this is the beginning. Uh, throughout Yellow 2, there's kind of a general co-option of iron produ production by Mound 4. So slag levels from iron production grow 
exponentially in mountains for during this period, such as some of the levels we dug through are just functionally flagged from iron production. And I'll talk about what that means in a moment. By the end of Yellow 2, even this iron furnace closes down. And so Mount 4 is beginning to control all of iron production. In Red 1, we have the emergence, kind of a centralization of power. There's lots of details in each of these periods. I'm giving you a little summary. Um, so if you have questions about the particulars of it, um, we can talk about that later. We see the kind of general co-option of power by Mound 4 continuing. All new mounds in the village are clustered around Mound 4. The burial monuments within the cemetery become very elaborate and accompanied by all sorts of things, like our first cowrie shells. All the livestock is being co-opted and is found within these, these areas right here. We don't have any cattle from anywhere else. Mound 4's family is controlling all the cattle. Um, they're controlling all the cowries. They have access to the cemetery and fancy monuments. Um, there's this general clustering around right here. And they control iron working completely. And I'll talk about what that means in a moment. Um, but that's a very dra dramatic statement. Another thing that occurs is that towards the end of the period, iron working shifts away from the village. Now I've been talking about mystery in the political process. And I think that in this trajectory, we're looking at the co-option of iron and making it mysterious. So originally, everyone was able to make iron, but it becomes co-opted within the political apparatus, and it gets removed from society as people are manipulating that hierarchy. So that's red one. It's a period of emergence of social ranking. But then everything changes in the polit political trajectory in the village. And um, this is a very dramatic moment in political history. And this is that revolution that I keep talking about. Everything changes. And we start to see something that's much more bois in its character. So this is kind of ethnogenesis. So they stop keeping cattle, which is an odd thing. You know, ethnographers would go to Western Burkina Faso and say, why don't these people keep cattle? Well, they used to keep cattle. And it was part of this centralization of power. But they actually stopped keeping cattle, even though the environment becomes better for them. And this is, you know, obviously around 1100 AD. It's been 900 years that they have not been keeping cattle. So it's not just like some disease went through. They could have replenished their stock very easily. Um, so they remove cattle working. The cemetery is closed. It's ritually closed and floored over, which was, of course, one of these reservoirs of power within the community. Architecture changes. People stop living in closed compounds. They live in these open room blocks, much more bois in character. They start doing all sorts of activities together, like collective hunting right here. Now, Collective hunt, something you can see in the archaeological record, is when an enormous number of animals are killed from many different ecological contexts, but within one ash lens. So it's like one killing event. And that is the residue of a collective hunt. It requires a lot of men to do. What it is is it's a bunch of guys get together, in some cases hundreds, and they create a large circle, and they flush all the animals into the center, and they kill them all pretty much indiscriminately. And in the archaeological record, we get you know, basically these distributions of an all different types of animals, from crocodiles to monkeys to um, cobs, reed bucks, warthogs, anything within that trajectory, and from different ecological zones. Sitatungas, which live in swamps, we find all those kinds of things, as if they are creating these enormous circles. And that's labor beyond a single house. There's not you know, a house that could create that kind of um, hunting signature. And we don't know of anything similar in the ethnographic record. Another thing which occurs is iron working gets removed. Gets removed way out here to this mound on the edge of town. And a new set of furnaces are established to the west of the village. Interestingly enough, potting becomes specialized at this point in time. And it's coupled with iron working. And I said that iron workers and potters today are married together and cannot marry into the legitimate political structure of the village. We have the archaeological signature of that particular pattern right there. So all those house traditions, every house making their own pottery, that disappears. Pottery becomes completely standardized. Everyone's using the exact same pottery. That is specialization, and that matches more the bois system that we have today. And ironworking is only found in this area. All the slag, all the furnaces are closed in this, in this core area of the village. But and then another interesting thing is that these are the farmers. So all the garden hunting uh, occurs within these houses right here. But the smiths and potters who today do not farm and are not allowed to farm categorically do not have any of those remains of hunting in the fields because they're not having fields. They're getting economic resources from the rest of the community. And 
in return making products for them, like pots and iron. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's a dramatic, enormous change in society. And I think part of this is, um, is the removal of power from one of the families is an egalitarian revolution potentially related to the emergence of the Doe religious system. Right? So I said that there's different nodes of power in Bois society, and it's about a decentralization of power. And so I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. This openness, the community becomes open and egalitarian, allows for new people to move into the region. And one of the things we know historically from, this is the period about 1400 AD, is that around this period, Monde groups from Mali moved into Burkina Faso to establish trade routes to the cities on the forest savanna margin. And we have some of the first archaeological evidence for this in Burkina Faso right here. These are actually from folks from Mali. They move into the village and establish their own neighborhood at Kiri Congo only after the revolution, after the very change in the nature of society towards an egalitarian, more open society, do they allow traders in. And so traders move into this region. Their pottery looks like it's coming from Jenny. You know, it's like from the inland Niger Delta. It's totally different. It's not voltaic in any way, shape, or form. But they're allowed to participate in the village community. So they're part of these hunts. Um, there's no evidence to suggest, even though they're Islamic, that they're converting others within the community. There is a mosque area on Mount 10 uh, derived from their habitation here. And then around 1700 AD, um, the village kind of it becomes abandoned. And that's what I'm investigating now in my regional survey to look at what's going on in the region at this time. But the, the last house to be abandoned is actually the founding house of the village. So this house was founded in 100 AD, and it was continually occupied until 1700 AD. And I think that is evidence that they're controlling the divinities, the pact with the divinities of nature, and also with ancestry within the village. So two different political missions I want to go over briefly, um, and then I'll take questions from you, is um, related to the two different periods in the village's history. And one is the emergence of inequality. And the emergence of inequality is fundamentally related to the co-option of iron production by the village's founding house. Iron, of course, um, can be a mysterious source of power, an exclusionary power, which matches many of our ethnographic observations of the ways people co-opt power. As we saw at Kiri Congo, iron was slowly co-opted over a period of 400, 500 years. But first, um, the members of Mound 4 co-opted the most potent parts of the ironworking process in part of this political manipulation. So originally, everyone could smelt iron and make iron tools. But slowly in yellow, too, the members of Mound 4 took the smelting component, but not the forging component of iron, away from the other houses before, in the next period, they completely took over the ironworking process. So why would they first take over the um, smelting part of the process? Well, the divinity or the potential power of ironworking is related to the divinities of the deep earth. And so the potent part of the process is actually when you excavate ore in the earth, and then you manipulate it within the furnace. Now, nowadays, the Bois do um, smelting in subterranean furnaces because it's in, set in the ground in that potent area. right? So the, the divinities that are related, these potentially potent divinities, are within the earth, but so is your forge um, and your furnace structures. And so. It's interesting that they co-opted first these very potent parts in terms of categorical distinctions with the divinities first before subsequently taking over the entire ironworking process. Right. So I think that's kind of an interesting point right there. A bunch of things occur along with taking over iron production in the village trajectory, one of which is the co-option of livestock. Now, obviously, centralization of power is seen in a whole bunch of different things, like all the new houses being um, settled right next to Mound 4. But one of the things we see is that during this period in which they've taken over iron production completely is they have a lot of the domestic animals in the community. And I mentioned the Quara Fetish and Garinzi Society and that the elites were taking over control of the community, but drawing all sorts of taxes into the system for ritual sacrifice. But then they consume the products of those things that they ritually sacrifice. I think a similar thing is occurring at Kiri Congo where these elites um, who are basing their power or manipulating the power of iron are drawing all sorts of domestic animals from the rest of the community for this sacrificial complex for the well-being of the community. And so what we see is they control all, all cattle by this period. 
most of the sheep and goats and most of the chickens. So everything's being co-opted by a single family in terms of, and that's one of the ways you can see a mater materialization of power. And I think that in general, kind of iron production, if you look at the general sequence, is correlated or heavily correlated with centralization of power. But another source of power, and it's enshrouded in mystery, but another source of power in the Bois trajectory is the dough. And that's part of this revolution. Now, I mentioned before that the dough is an egalitarian religious system. But it's enshrouded in mystery itself. But the mystery is revealed to everyone upon their initi initiation, right? So if you're a three-year-old, you haven't gone through initiation, the dough is considered crazy, mysterious, and dangerous, right? And you're kind of horrified to go through your initiation because you don't know what it is um, and how powerful it's going to be in your life. And so what happens within the initiation process is you have a spiritual battle with the dough. And then the secrets of the dough, the mysteries, revealed to you at the point of your initiation. And then you become a member of the dough society. Right? But that's an egalitarian participatory mystery. So it's not a mystery for exclusionary power. It's a mystery for collective power and something that bonds everyone together, going through that journey of mystery. And a whole bunch of things are correlated in the community, I think, with, um, which are materializations of the emergence of the dough. And this is the opening of the architecture towards the community, because this is a very communal-focused religious system. The rejection of cattle is a rejection of those inequalities. That ritual sacrifice um, connected to iron production with the movement of iron production to a restricted family outside of the political process. So that's where we get these categorical distinctions in Bois society between you know, farmers, smith potters, and griots. Right? I think that's a decentralization of power to create checks and balances between these different nodes all mediated by an egalitarian relationship within the dough. And I think you see that in the closing of the cemetery, and also for the evidence for collective activities like hunting that could not be done within the labor of a single house. So I think, you know, in terms of modeling the archaeological record, what I've been doing in terms of interpreting the archaeology is we have to understand Voltaic societies and Voltaic logics and ideologies and basic social units before you can say anything about the archaeological record. Um, and that is the gift of anthropological archaeology to archaeology. If you come up with generalized models for how things are supposed to work, you would not see much of this because you have to understand how power is materialized in a voltaic context. So just a little note, this research at Kiri Congo is continuing. Um, next step, of course, is to go outside of the site of Kiri Congo and see what's going on with the political events at Kiri Congo in a greater region. right? How does Kiri Congo relate to a broader region in iron production in this period of increasing inequalities? Do other sites cluster around Kiri Congo? Are other commodities involved in centralization of power? And is the revolution uh, period, is that something that's shared by multiple sites? Does specialized potting occur in other communities at this particular junction in time? Um, and so last winter, I did a large regional survey around Kiri Congo, and we're just beginning to look at the data from this kind of expanded project. So these are all, we found 31 different sites um, that are contemporary with Kiri Congo during different points in time. So here's Kiri Congo, which is a large site. But these are all other Iron Age archaeological sites. And we've done some test units in some of the other ones. And we're going to be exploring greater political process within the region over the next couple of years. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to address kind of broader political issues. And so here's my team. Archaeology, of course, can't be done you know, alone. So you work with students. These are students from the University of Ouagadougou. Um, you partner with people in the local communities. And so everyone's pretty interested in this political uh, evolutionary research. And so that's kind of what we've been doing. So I am perfectly willing to take any questions or comments uh, as people would like to do. Well, one of the interesting things that um, one of the interesting things about economics in this area is that there's been a huge focus because of the kind of there's been a research focus on Monday societies, 
on Monde societies in Mali, right? Because they're involved in these trade routes and commodification networks. So most archaeology has actually been done in places like Mali or further south in Ghana, right? In, in the emergence of these trade routes. One of the interesting things in Western Burkina Faso is that historically, folks didn't trade much. They often produced vegetal salts. Um, they made a lot of product locally. They weren't involved in a lot of the gold trade, and they weren't involved in many of these other commodity exchanges within the region. There was almost like a rejection of trading. And I think that might be derivative in part of this revolutionary period, where you're kind of getting rid of some of those networking things which are based in exclusionary power often. But that creates the social setting for the emergence of Monde trading diasporas. Right? Prior to this, you have Voltaic societies with extreme, some of them with pretty extreme amounts of power, controlling strong divinities. And we don't see a lot of this kind of interregional trade. It is interesting to me that we know historically that Monde societies expanded in their trade diaspora in the 14th and 15th centuries. And I wonder if that's because they could move into the area after the revolution and themselves set up the trade route. And that's where we see the emergence of Monde societies all the way to Ghana during this period to actually create Monde folks who are facilitating the trade. So you see little neighborhoods like what we saw at Kiri Congo um, sending trade goods all the way from Ghana to the inland Niger Delta when they may not have had so much luck if they were trying to trade the commodities through Voltaic societies who may not have been interested in this trade. Um, and so concepts of commodification, concepts of power and exclusionary relationships, and what is this Monde trading diaspora and why it occurs when it occurs, may be in part because of a general social and political um, milieu at the time in which we know it occurred. Um, and so I think that's some of the interesting stuff that's going on. The Bois don't even chew cola nuts. You know, they're not interested in that stuff. So, you know. Well, iron working is part of a, a very big debate in Africa um, in general. They are, the pottery from early Kiri Congo is very similar to pottery from the late Kintampa society in Ghana, um, which is one of these societies that right at the end of the Kintampo period, around 500 BC, you get the emergence of iron working. So these, I think, are people from that very group that emerged in Burkina Faso as part of this general trend. But there's some of the earliest iron producers in Burkina Faso that we know of. There's some iron furnaces in Bois, in what is today Bois territory from about 300 BC, uh, like the site of Bena. And so that's some of our earliest iron working in Burkina Faso. And so these iron working farmers spread throughout this western part of Burkina Faso. In eastern Burkina Faso, something different seems to have occurred. And iron working seems to be slightly later in time. But these folks are part of this general early period of iron working and farming. Well, there's not smelting as much going on since the 60s, but there is forging. As you saw, that, that iron worker right there is from Pora, you know, basically four years ago. So iron smiths are hugely important in Bois society, even today. And the, their control over various divinities is, is hugely important, and they still play a role in the judicial process. And everyone still does hoe-based agriculture. Uh, in Western Burkina Faso. So they control access to the tools that everyone uses to farm. And so while today they don't actually smelt because they can get cheaper, you know, irons from various sources. And this started in the colonial era. And so smelting became less and less common over the colonial era. They still make all the tools by hand. And there, you can often, if you go into a blacksmith's um, compound, you'll see all sorts of metals that they're melting down to use for hose. So I've seen interesting things, like I've seen a World War I musket being melted down for an agricultural tool today. And you see all sorts of things like that going on in the compounds. So they're still interacting with metals, um, doing all sorts of interesting things with them. But they don't do as much smelting because it's just not economically feasible. It's a lot more work, and there's all these cheap irons uh, flooding the market.
you know, one of the interesting things is so I did this, this regional survey last winter. And so I've been looking at the regional site distribution. And it's interesting to me that you'd think that during the slave trade, they would have a defensive settlement pattern, right? So that people would cluster in villages for protection, right? But what we actually see in the archaeological record is that's a period of extreme dispersion in the landscape. Um, that's after the revolution. You know, functionally what happens is people abandon these large centers like Kiri Congo and they disperse into little homesteads again throughout the landscape. This is not a defensive um, system. It's not until the what would appear to be the late mid to late 1800s that people start clustering for defense. And that's from what we know the 19th century was a particularly difficult time with a bunch of state formation events in Mali and in other parts of Burkina Faso. But from the Atlantic slave trade period, we actually don't see a defensive um, settlement structure in the landscape. So some of our assumptions on how these societies are relating to other ones might be misguided. And so we need to kind of understand. These things are very poorly understood. There's very little archaeology on the interior uh, parts of West Africa. Almost all the slave trade era stuff is on the coasts. So we understand the stuff that's along the coast, but once you go into the interior, we don't know where slaves are coming from. You know, we don't know what societies are doing. Um, but there's all these assumptions as to which societies are kind of being victims and which ones are not. Um, and I think these are all open intellectual questions that we need to kind of investigate by increasing archaeology. These are complicated topics. They're a hugely important topics in the modern world. And so we need to understand them. And so we need more archaeologists working on the interior to understand how societies are relating to one another. But in the archaeology of this region, I'm not seeing a lot of it. But you know, these egalitarian folks tended to have um, their communalism, the collectivism, and their hatred of inequality was something that even kicked out the French. Um, one of the only areas where there was successful anti-colonial resistance was in the area I'm working in. They kicked out the French for three years. Uh, during World War I. They rose up and killed off the French officials in Dadugu, and then um, they kicked out the French. And the French had to come and retake the area. But because there weren't centralized leaders, the French couldn't take out a king. So they had to go village to village in retaking the region. And the reason that they rose up is because they disliked people having power over them. It's part of this egalitarian, bois egalitarianism. And that is a very effective mechanism for protection even in this dispersed landscape. So the question of the slave period, the Atlantic slave trade, is an open question that needs to be intellectually grappled with. But this was also an area where they threw out the French colonial government, which didn't happen in many parts of West Africa. So, you know, yeah. And then the second question is, why is it the case that uh, they decided to disperse this power as opposed to collectivize the power? Would they be able to do that as well, just like they did with cattle? Well, cattle are, I'll answer the second question. So cattle are related to bride wealth. And people who co-opt lots of power also co-opt a lot of wives and labor. And so the social units tend to get larger over time. Cattle just tend to be manipulated really easily. And so I think that the Guan system that I mentioned, I think the Guan system might itself be a construct, a kind of anti-exclusionary um, power system where the, all the wealth goes to the matriline. I think that's one mechanism to maintain egalitarianism while keeping cattle husbandry in your society. I think the Bois saw them as too, you know, just too potent, too manipulatable. Let's just get rid of the whole thing. And I think in Guan society, they chose a different thing. Disperse them to the matriline, get them out of the house so no one can intergenerationally control that power. So I think if you look at the different societies within Burkina Faso, there's some who keep cattle and some who don't. But if you look at the characteristics of them, there seems to always be an out for the egalitarian people who keep cattle. And most of the societies who keep cattle who don't have that out have inequalities in them. And so then the Bois system and the Bobo and Sanufo, who don't tend to keep cattle um, very often, that just might be a rejection of that very potency and potential for inequality. People consciously make political actions just like we do, and, and one must assume in the past that people also made those calculations. 
if cattle were such a hugely important part of inequality uh, during the 400 years prior to their rejection, they may just have been associated with that power. And kind of creating a communalistic cattle thing may not have se been seen as an acceptable or smart decision um, if you're going to try to keep equality. Questions of timing. Now that's an excellent question. Because there's a couple of different things going on during this period. I said that the dough maintains our relationships with the divinities of rainfall. It's interesting that the revolution occurs at a time in which, this, in which the environment starts to become more arid in West Africa. And so it might be that the elites who control the iron working, this is in my book, in the, in the conclusion of my book, that the elites who controlled the divinities in iron working, these powerful divinities, may have lost legitimacy in terms of their relationship with nature during this period, or some kind of event like that. It eroded their power, and subsequently, that may have spurred parts of the revolution. This seems to have been a regional event. It's not something that's limited to Kiri Congo. The Doe religious system is shared by multiple ethnic groups. And, but I'm the only archaeologist who's really done work in this entire region, so we don't know whether that history is shared or what the timing of that history was in other parts of Burkina Faso or Mali. So the questions of timing. That being said, I always say that you can't necessarily solely appeal to environmental determinism and, and kind of justifications for losses of exclusionary power. Because if that was the case, then the American Revolution wouldn't occur. Because that wasn't correlated with, say, an environmental collapse or a justification. Political actions, I think centralization and exclusionary power can be rejected in different trajectories at any time. Because people can be offended by centralization of power um, or abuses of power. And so without knowing the context behind it, it'd be easier to appeal to the rainfall explanation. But I am never going to say that it was that explanation. I'll say that's one possible explanation. Because I think extreme inequality is always a cause for changes in political structures. And that's what we've seen historically in ancient Greece, um, in the Western political trajectory, and in other parts of the world where we see these kinds of drastic political events occur. As I said, that um, hunting is a collective activity. Well, hunting, the leaders of hunts are actually um, achieved hierarchies. So hunting is one of those things where you're just good at it if you're good at it, right? So it's not one of those kinds of hierarchies that you can just be a good hunter if you're from a particular family and pass it on to your son who might not be a good hunter or whatever. So it tends to be an achieved hierarchy. And so within the Doe um, religious system, Age sets are the ones who hunt together. And the leader of the hunt, the person who does the ritual sanctification, oftentimes is just the person who's good at it. So it's a very egal hunting is a much more egalitarian um, kind of political mechanism and construct than some of these other ones are. Because if you're just a terrible hunter, you're not going to be able to use that in any type of political mission. You still have to be able to kill the cob. That's another interesting point. So prior, you know, the emergence of inequalities is something that tends to, in archaeology, we know from lots of different cases, it's something that happens slowly. So initially, the cemetery is only for the adult dead of Mound 4. But one of the interesting things is, is that one of the ways you can see power being transferred to young without achieving anything is by infants, right, and infant burials. So at the point of extreme inequality, the last burials in the cemetery are actually a whole bunch of infant burials that are treated like adults with all these kinds of symbols of power. That means they were born to that status. Um, they didn't achieve that status. Before that, we don't know. Because adults who are um, buried in kind of a sumptuary manner, that means that they may have achieved it, but they may have been given it at birth. We don't know. But once you start getting all the infants also buried in the cemetery with all of those kind of kind of trappings of exclusionary power, then it's very clear, particularly in Voltaic logic, where infants who are not, um, haven't gone through initiation are barely people. It's a hugely symbolic thing to bury infants with cowrie shells. This last burial monument has 
90% of all the cowrie, bells, um, cowrie shells they found at Curie Congo with infant burials and cattle bones and iron. I mean, it's kind of crazy. But that's wealth being given to infants who haven't achieved it. You know, so that's a hugely political kind of event. But good question. <laughs> Any other questions?